Well, very good morning, 3CR. It's actually evening in Pretoria, but uh, morning to you, Sunday morning, and uh, to Solid Ground in Middleburg. It's amazing that you're joining us. James and I met this week, and I kind of said, hey, why don't you join us for a few weeks? So I kind of imposed myself on you, Solid Ground, um, but there's a reason why. But uh, God will show us that, and uh, it's fantastic to be with you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for su- supporting our project, and to our friends at The Rock in Durban, I think this is your seventh or eighth week together with us. It's great doing life with you. Thank you for supporting us, for loving us. Uh, We're doing a series called The Megaloth, which is five books in the Old Testament. And tonight we're going to look at the book of Ruth, or as we say in Afrikaans, Rit. And um, so the book of Ruth, we find it uh, just after the Judges and the Old Testament. It's an incredible book, and I think it's particularly helpful. So let's read the first chapter together. And uh, let's read actually the last verse of Judges, the book before. And Judges chapter 21 and verse 25 says, In those days Israel had no king, and everyone did as he saw fit. Um, It it kind of might remind you a little bit of our nation right now. Uh, All the different departments of our government don't seem to be under any form of government. It seems like they can do whatever they like with PPEs or SAA or whatever it might be. It just seems like there's complete anarchy in our land. This was written thousands of years ago. In the days when the judges ruled, when actually everybody did their own thing, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, which means God is king. So if God is your king, don't make stupid decisions. Don't leave God's people, don't leave the church and live in a foreign land, because God is perfectly able to provide in his land, in his church, even when it's tough times. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name Naomi, which means pleasant, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other named Ruth. After they'd lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, God will always come to the aid of his people. Naomi and his daughter-in-law prepared to return home from there. Say there. Wherever there is for you in Middleburg, Durban, or Pretoria, my plea to you would be return home from there. We have a saying in this church, when you're in trouble, run to the church. When you've just done the worst thing in your life, run to the church. When you've just made the biggest mistake in your life, run to the church. When you've just committed the greatest sin in your life, run to the church. Wherever there is for you, run to the church. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road. Say set out on the road. road. My prayer today is that people would set out on a road. That they would actually choose a destination to get back into the center of God's will for their lives and for their family. That would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back each of you to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait for them to grow up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. At this they wept again, then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and to her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to go back from you. Where you go, I will go. 
Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord be, deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped trying to urge her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman exclaimed, Can this be Naomi, which means pleasant? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, which means bitter. Because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabites, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem at the barley harvest was beginning. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech, a man of standing. Say man of standing. Man of standing. Whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabites said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in, in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. As it turned out. Say that with me. As it turned out. As it turned out. Or so it, happened. so it happened. As it turned out, she found herself working in the field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. So guys, we've got this amazing story. Let me give you some context. The context, firstly, is anarchy. There's absolutely no government. The systems are working. Accountability has fallen apart. And past presidents won't answer to constitutional court orders and appear before any governmental rules. So there's anarchy that's taking place in the land. So people say to me, what hope do we have? We just read Ruth. The second thing that happens is that there's famine in the land. First there's famine in Bethlehem, and then there's famine in Moab. There's a major economic crisis. And people say to me, Rory, do you understand? I understand fully. I run a business. My biggest customer are Greyhound buses. They stop at my business. That is the lifeblood of my business. Three weeks ago, they went bankrupt. I fully understand famine. And I'm not in any way unsympathetic to anybody in the church that is going through tough times. But friends, we are on a spiritual journey, not a financial journey. And God is able to provide through His church in famine times without us actually having to leave to go to a funny land called Moab. The third thing that we see here is that there's death. People died. Husbands died. And brothers died. And I can't even look in the front row of a mum and a wife and a, a daughter sitting who lost their husband just a few weeks ago to COVID. And so there's death of beautiful people. The first thing we see is bad decisions. People suffer sometimes because others make bad decisions. Elimelech, God is king, took his family to a strange land, and we suffer because other people make decisions for our lives. It's real. Guys have made business decisions and they've lost their businesses and families are sitting now under incredible pressure because bad decisions were made. And the last thing we see in this particular scripture is that there's sexual sort of discrepancy, there's sexual diversity, there's sexual, there's a darkness around sexuality. You say, but Rory, how does that happen? Well, if you read Genesis chapter 19... There's a story of Sodom, where we get our word sodomy from. So they had a sexual distortion taking place there. And out of Sodom came Lot and his wife, and his wife looked backwards. She became a pillar of salt. And then his daughters realized that they couldn't find a man to make them pregnant. So they made, made their dad drunk in the Bible. They made their dad drunk. They slept with their father. And the Moabites were born. Ruth was a... Moabite. Elimelech decided to rather go to an incestuous city than to trust God in Bethlehem. And so friends, even sitting here in this room tonight, I know some stories. I know about abortions that have taken place with people sitting in this room. I know, looking at the TV, I know some of you in Middleburg. I know you in The Rock. There's not just abortions. There's sexual licentiousness. There's sexual 
darkness. They say, it's all these things. They think, but flip, Rory, how's this going to help us? Because this story ends with the lineage of David, which becomes the lineage of Christ. And it's a story, friends, that starts with absolutely everything against God's people, but ends up with the genealogy of Jesus. And wherever you are today, in a land of anarchy, in a land of famine, in a land of bad choices, in a land of death, of loved ones, or a land of sexual darkness, you're in the right place today. You're listening to the right sermon. God is integrally involved in your life. It's just a story, Ruth. On the one side of this Bible story, you've got all the heroes of the faith, Abraham and Moses and Joshua, all these like unbelievable leaders on this side. You've got Samuel and David and Solomon. And in the middle, you've got this unbelievable little story that takes place in a field in Groblesdal between a rich Afrikaans farmer and a Zimbabwean refugee. That's how it works itself out. You see, we all love the big stories of Jericho when the whole of Israel marches around Jericho one time, two times, three times, four times, five times, seven times, blow the trumpet, pa, 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 the whole walls come falling down. Awesome story. I want an awesome story. Now, some stories just happen in, in a maize field in Hroblesdal with a refugee and a rich farmer and no fanfare. But in that story, friends, if that story doesn't take place, we can't link the big salvation story of Genesis to the kings, which eventually brings out Christ. And I want, I want to say to you, it doesn't matter where your story is now. God has got an ability to weave a redemptive pattern around your story so that you become part of a far bigger story called the story of salvation that will touch the ends of the earth. That's the book of Ruth. I got a message this week, friends. My phone. It says this. Good morning, Mr. Dyer. 19 years to this day, we picked up Hannah from Aber Adoptions in Pretoria. Today, Hannah returns to Pretoria to enroll in Tux. Adopted a little girl. We were in Glenridge in Durban. We threw a party for Hannah. We had thousands of balloons. We had a whole party. We bought tens of thousands of rands worth of food. We had a banner made. Welcome home, Hannah. We celebrated and danced and worshipped for an hour and a half, welcoming home a little girl we had never met. This is what her dad says. Thank you for so warmly embracing her, so warmly embracing her all those years ago. And I pray Hannah walks into 3CI in the next few weeks and something deeply destiny activating happens in her heart. Blessings and strength to you, Mel and the children. 19 years ago, friends, we welcomed a little girl because somebody read about adoption in a story and they came to Pretoria and, they, and, and, and she's back in Pretoria and she's going to come into my home. Last week, my biological son led worship. Not because he's my son, because he expressed it last year in lockdown every day for three hours. I heard him learning the guitar. Then he got given a guitar. Then I heard, watched him pay for music lessons or get blessed with music lessons. And last week, he led worship. This week, worship was led by a young man that I watched get passed from children's home to children's home to children's home. He's never met his father. He ended up in a village run by my friend, Titch Smith, called Live Village. And Titch phoned me and he said, he's coming up to Tiki's. I said, he's coming into my home. So worship is led by my biological son. Now worship is led by a man whose story has been interwoven with the goodness of God. Through orphanages and children's homes and, and drought and bad decisions and rejection and abandonment. God starts to knit the story together. Little bit by little bit by little bit by little bit by little bit. Madela, my wife lost her dad when she was 15 years old. I can't make the pain go away, but I can preach the book of Ruth to you. I can tell you that God is always kind. And no matter where your story is and no matter how you feel. 
one day when you look back, it will make sense. If her dad never died, I would never have met her, even now. God in heaven is preparing the very man that you will marry in five or six or seven years' time. And somehow it will be linked to the death of your dad. And God will be glorified. And you will worship again one day and give a testimony of the hand of God in your life. But until such time, this is a safe community. We will love you. Because the Bible says the field of Boaz was a safe place. A very safe place. I took a group of pastors out for dinner this week. Guys have all contributed to our building fund, including the guys from Solid Ground. The rock guys weren't here, but thank you too. But I was sitting there and I got a message from our accountant and it just said, Cedars Church, 71,000 rand, build a base. It's about the fifth one that I've got from them. You see, friends, you have to understand that I am Ruth. Say, I am Ruth. I am Ruth. Say, I am Ruth. I am Ruth. You see, it's very easy for us to say, I am Boaz. I'm the guy who's got it all together. The feminists hate this book. They think, flip, I don't like the Bible because there's always some broken woman that has to be rescued by some hero man. That's not the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth is not about some distraught woman that needs to be rescued by a, a chauvinistic man with money. The book of Ruth is about a sinner who is broken and used and impoverished and is isolated and alienated and has no citizenship, who needs salvation by Jesus and as I sat, friends, as I sat in a coffee shop this week and writing my prayers and writing my preparation for this preach, a Zimbabwean lady came up to me. I was writing my prayers and I was writing about Ruth and she said to me, Pastor. And I looked at her and I thought, yes, Ruth. And I felt God say, no, you, Ruth Rory. You are Ruth Rory. Friends, I shouldn't be in 3CI. I'm an outsider to 3CI. I never paid the price for 3CI. I never bought the land for 3CI. I never participated in the financing of 3CI. Grant Askham and his wife Charmaine came down to Durban and they said to us, Rory, would you and Melanie please relocate and come and be part of And I live in this privilege and this space and this land and this grace and the relationships and the people and the opportunities. But I'm an outsider. That got invited in. And one of those guys who invited in, me in was Adrian. And then he went and planted a church. But he's not an outsider sitting in Stellenbosch. He said, hey, Raw, 71 grand from Cedars. I think it's five times they've done that. Because they want to be part of our inside story. You know, friends, as a pastor, and this has been a pastoral journey we've been through over the last five weeks. I sit and wrestle because I'm a soft-hearted man. I sit and wrestle between the protection of the sanctuary and the reality of people's lives who are inside of our church. And if you've been in church with me for any length of time, you will know that I always stand on the veranda. I will meet you in the veranda, and when you leave, I'll be the last person standing on the veranda because I believe the veranda of the church is the place of warfare. Our architects and builders have done something unbelievably unique in our building. They've put a crooked staircase in. The building is perfectly straight. But our staircase entering in the building is half a meter off. And when you go and stand there, you just want to fix it. You, you, you want to straighten it out. And, and, and you want to make everything align. And, and, and I said, but why is the staircase crooked? They said, because this church welcomes crooked people. This church is open to sexually alienated or, or debauched people. This church is open to those who are brokenhearted. This church is open to those who have made bad decisions. This church is open to those who have died inside, sexually, emotionally. This church is open to the crooked and to the bankrupt, just slightly off. And I realize, friends, as a pastor that I stand on that crooked staircase and I hold in my one hand the truth of an almighty and sovereign God. But I hold in my other hand murky marriages 
an adolescent confusion, an ethical diversity, and governmental anarchy, an emotional brokenness. And we sing, good, good father, and you live with a bad, bad husband. And we say, miracle worker. Your dad died of COVID. And I've got to, as a pastor, pull these two worlds together. I've got to stand on the veranda of the church and say, I will do warfare with these two worlds. Because I can't come and just live in your world because I will lose hope and I will lose the opportunity and I will lose a perspective that I find in the sanctuary. But if I invite you in, friends, maybe just for one or two hours, you'll find the peace of a good, good father, of a miracle worker, a way maker, a light in the dark place. And that as we bless you, you go out with some kind of courage as you walk into your muddled marriage. But I realize as I look at this book that the storyteller meets these people at their place, not expecting them to come to his place. And I, in some ways, want to repent as a pastor today, even to 3CI. The two mistakes we make is that we preach a kind of a moralism. Be holy because God is holy. Be pure because God is pure. They Moabites. They've come from Sodom. There's incest here. There's unbelievable brokenness here. I can't say be holy because God is holy. I must come down out of my pulpit and with this hand hold them gently. And bring them to Boaz. Bring them to Christ who stands up straight. I say, I can't help you, but Boaz can help you. Boaz can redeem you. Boaz can help you. You see that the story sometimes when you serve God a long time, it's very easy to become condescending. Condescending is when my high place looks down on you. And 3CR, if I've ever done this to you, I'm sorry. But I'm so radical for God. I'm so free for God. I understand generosity and freedom and worship. And sometimes I stand up and I say, I wish you conservative people would just worship. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. One man spoke to him on the veranda. He says, why do you keep knocking our conservatism? I said, because I want you to be free. Now, I will meet you on the veranda, sir. And I will hold in my hand the freedom I have in Christ. And I trust I will hold you gently, your conservatism. And bust my guts to try and pull the two together. But I hope, whether you live in anarchy or in famine, whether you live as a result of bad decisions, or you're suffering from the death of a close one, or your life has been one of sexual debauchery. I pray when you walk up our crooked stairs, you would walk into a straight up man called Jesus, who can start to build a story, little bit by little bit. Hannah, from Abba to Durban, back to Pretoria, into my home. Justin, from child care to child care to child care to my friend Titch to my home to worship God is weaving a story you are not excluded from it I don't care how dark I don't care how bad I don't care how disgusting I don't care how far away you are God will build your story into his story and create the lineage of Christ we ask ourselves this question, how did these people become part of the story? How did they enter the story? I'm only just getting started and I haven't got much time left. This is how Naomi entered the story. Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara. Call me Bitter. Because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. 
the Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. You know what we say? Hey, don't be cross with God. Why not? She was cross with God. The storyteller didn't wash it over and say, you can't be cross with God. I don't need to defend God. He can defend himself. But in the church, we say, no, no, sort yourself out. Don't get bitter. My wife was bitter. We went to church and I lifted my hands and she kept her hands down. And I said to her, what's wrong with you? She said, God took my father. It doesn't get written out of the story. It's in the story. But Elaine, are there going to be days when you think, oh God Almighty, why? Such a beautiful man, such a strong man, why? Don't be scared to be cross with God. He can defend himself. And he can actually lead you to freedom. Don't be bitter with others. If you feel God has made you bitter and taken things away from you, then lay them down. Write them down. I've been bitter in my life. But if you're bitter, make sure you get a mature person who knows God. Jeremiah put God on the stand. He said, I'm going to put you in a court case. You're so unfair, God. It's not right. What's happening in my life is not right. It's okay. God used Naomi to build a story. You know, she said an amazing thing. When she spoke about going back, she says, God is kind. God is kind. Do you know where that comes from? That comes from the Ten Commandments, that word. The word is chesed or chesed. H-E-S-E-D or C-H-E-S-E-D, chesed. Or as one of my Zimbabwean said, friends says, God, he chesed me. God, he chesed me. He chesed me. God, he chesed me. That word, friends, is the steadfast love of God. It is the steadfast faithfulness of God. It is written in the Ten Commandments. We are in a covenant with God. That's the Old Testament. We are in a new covenant of God. And inside of that covenant is kindness and steadfast love. Naomi knew that. And the author says, okay, Naomi, you're bitter with God. That's okay. Some of you in Middleburg, you're bitter with God now. It's okay. Some of you in Durban, you're bitter with God. It's okay. Write it down. Naomi, why are you bitter? Because I left here full and I've come back empty. Is that why you're bitter on me? Yes. God has afflicted me. He's taken everything away from me. Okay, Naomi. Ruth goes into a field of a man who's kind. Ruth says to Boaz, why do you speak to me so kindly? Chesed, chesed. The Ten Commandments. Why do you repeat the commandments? Why do you repeat the covenants of God over me? We bankrupt. We've got nothing to offer. Chesed. 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 He says to his staff, you must treat her chesed, kindly. And then she comes back and she's got a little bit of extra stuff. And she gives it to her mother-in-law who is empty-handed. And she gets a little bit of chesed. And she says this, how is it that you landed up in the field of Boaz who has shown us such Say it? Chesed. Kindness. She's bitter, but she's got a little piece of God inside of her. And we just, she, he doesn't say stop being bitter. Stop arguing about your divorce. Stop fighting me about the death of your dad. He just says, be bitter with me. And I'm going to put you on a journey. I'm going to put relationships in place, a group of people in a community. Who, who will, you're just going to happen to come across them. It's just as it turns out. There's a lady who writes to me every now and again. You'll be listening today because you always listen. And this is how she writes to me. At the end, she says, much love, the U-turn lady. The U-turn lady. And she puts her name. Because one Sunday, she was driving along Atterbury Road. She was driving away. And God said, do a U-turn and go to a church called 3CI. So she did a U-turn. And when she walked in, she bumped into Boaz, to Christ. 
who met her in her brokenness, who met her in her frailness, who met her in her bitterness and slowly took her on her journey. And now she's standing up straight. You will stand up straight. You will stand up straight. You will stand up straight. How long, Rory? I don't know. But God is kind and his community is good. And we are not moralizing and we are not condescending. We will meet you at your place, lead you up the crooked stairs and present to you God Almighty. How did Ruth get into the story? A Moabite. Six times this book says Ruth the Moabite. Can you imagine being known as Ruth the product of incest? That's, that's your, the divorcee. The failure. The one who didn't make it. The dropout. The dunce. The fool. Society's got unbelievable names Ways of naming us, friends. This is what it says. Ephesians chapter 2. It will come up on the scriptures. It says this. Ephesians 2 and verse 11. It says, Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth, 98% of us in this room, and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ. Say separate. separate. You were separate from Christ, excluded from citizens. Say excluded. excluded. Separate, excluded. Excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise. Say foreigners. Foreign. Separate, excluded, foreigners, without hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away, say far away, away. have been brought near through the blood of Christ. We are Ruth. We are excluded. We don't have citizenship in God's people. But he brought us close. That's why, friends, you cannot have racism or sexism inside of your heart. Because you were also excluded. You're also a Moabite. Or a drug addict, or a sinner, or a swearer, or a sex addict. And God brought you close. And he weaves story around broken people and puts them into the genealogy of Christ. She was called a Moabites. She was called a daughter-in-law over and over and over again. She had as an alien, she had no citizenship. She was called a widow. And she was called a servant. But you know how she got into the story? She's an amazing woman. Her mother-in-law grooms her and says, hey, listen, put a bit of perfume on. Some new clothes. When Boaz lies down, after he's had a good chow and a couple of Yeah? Line loggers. When he's sleeping, you must just go and lie at his feet. And the way that you got redeemed is that they would throw their cloak over you. You can read it in Ezekiel 16. It says, Jesus saw the church naked. And so he threw his cloak over her. And this is what the mother-in-law says. She says, when he says, when he asks, what do you want? Wait, and he will tell you what to do. So she has got nothing to stand on. She's a Moabite. She's a widow. She's used property. She's not a virgin. She's used property. She's got no money. And she's got her mother-in-law telling her what to do. But when Boaz says, what can I do for you? She says, marry me. <laughs> she breaks the box. She breaks her Moabite. She breaks her daughter-in-law. She makes a step of faith and says, Jesus, I want to give my life to you. 
I want to step out of the box. I want to count for you. I want to marry you. I want to have children with you. I want to become the genealogy of Christ. I'm stepping out in faith. Society can't label me Moabite. They can't label me daughter-in-law. They can't label me used property. Please, Boaz, will you throw your cloak over and marry me? Sometimes we've got to step out of the societal demands upon our lives, friends, and just make a decision for Jesus. Amen? Amen. I pray today, Middleburg, Durban, Pretoria, make a decision for Jesus. Step out. Divorced. Licentious. Abortion. Stop it. Stop it. Be brave. Step out of it. You're not a victim. Boaz, Jesus, wants to redeem you. He wants to form covenant with you and partnership with you. Today, people's lives change. Today, people's lives change. You will not be known by a label. You will not be known by your marital status. You will not be known by your level of education. You'll be known as a person redeemed by Christ. I was a foreigner, an alien, set apart, far away. But now, now, It's the book of Ruth. In the midst of what? In the midst of South Africa. In the midst of an economic slump. In the midst of a COVID crisis. In the midst of death and sexual disorientation. God is busy saving people and writing their stories into his. Amen? Amen. It's enough for tonight. Let's pray. Father, I pray as a pastor, Lord God, if I've moralized anyone, I've tried to let them live, call them to a, a life above my own, or in any way condescended and made them feel inferior in any way because of their choices. I pray today, Lord God, that we would meet people exactly where they are at. In death, in anarchy, in bitterness, in labels, in brokenness, in disqualification. Some of you don't think you're worthy for God to include you in the story. My task as a pastor is to teach you the book of Ruth. And tell you it doesn't matter what giants surround you. Moses, Joshua, Abraham, Samuel, David, Solomon. Your story, Hannah. Your story, Justin. Your story, Sarah. Maggie. Madela. Your story, Francois and David. And Joshua. Your story, Chris. Bernalee and Mika and Mateo and James. And Stanton. And Becky and Tumela. And Daniel. Your story can be redemptively weaved into the grand story of salvation, however far away you are. O oh God, on the crooked steps of 3CI, I declare war for the freedom of the people that need to hear about Boaz, the Redeemer. God bless you, 3CI. God bless you, The Rock. God bless you, Solid Ground. In Jesus' name, amen.